13, beginning of verse 21 today. Have you ever had to go into a dangerous situation? I mean, something that really is physically dangerous. Uh, long, long ago, when I was working in a cabinet shop in San Bernardino, uh, I was working on the paint shop, and a one of the guys from the paint booth comes walking outside and walks out in the middle of the field and turns around and looks back at the building. <laughs> and he just stands there. And so several of us ran inside, and there was a fire in the paint booth because of all the lacquer and fumes and everything. And so because we were in the paint shop, we all had masks on, and so we grabbed hoses and fire extinguishers and went in there and put the fire out. It was kind of dangerous. And obviously, by the guy who didn't want to do anything <laughs> or didn't even say anything. <laughs> Now, in, in a situation like that, you realize you could get hurt, but there were a bunch of other people working in that shop as well that could have been hurt if that fire got out of control. So it, it's not an easy decision to make, but sometimes you're you're stuck with that. What do I do? Do I do this or not? Let's take a look. John chapter 13, beginning at verse 21. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at loss to know which of them he meant. Let's pray. Father, speak to us through your word. Help us to see what this has to do with us here in the 21st century. And help us, Lord, to live for you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. After he said, what? Well, talking about the foot washing session. You know, I've done this for you. You should do this for one another. So after he said that, then he says, one of you is going to betray me. You see the very human side of Jesus here. He's in complete control of the situation, and yet he's not unmoved. It's, it's sad. It's bad. It's a horrible thing for him to have to deal with. And so because of that, it says he testified to them. Very truly, one of you is going to betray me. That word testified, it's used in a legal type sense. It's an accusation. One of you is going to betray me. The very enemy of Jesus is a close friend. It's a truism that you can only be betrayed by someone you trust. Some of you don't trust can't betray you because you haven't got any trust in them. And so here it is, one of the twelve, uh, you and I know, Jesus is one of the twelve, and he is the one who betrayed Jesus. As a matter of fact, every time in the New Testament you see Judas Iscariot named, it's always followed by the one who betrayed Jesus. All the way through. So here he is, you and I, because we know the story, know, what, know what's going on. But the other disciples, they don't know that. They don't have a clue. Judas was a smooth operator. He was the one who carried the money belt. They trusted him. Now neither here nor anywhere else does someone express, I wonder if it's Judas. Someone, I know who it is. It's Judas. Nope, nobody does that because man judges on the outward appearance, whereas God sees the heart. And nobody mistrusted Judas. They trusted him to this point. And so when he betrays Jesus, it's a complete surprise to all of them. And even now when Jesus says this, they don't know who it is. Look at verse 23. I should look at verse 23. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one it means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? 
Jesus answered, It's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Okay, now there's some background here that I need to cover. I told you before that they didn't sit around a table at chairs like you're sitting at now like we eat today. They had a low sort of coffee table and they arranged these lounge chairs all the way around it so that everybody's head was toward the table and their feet were away from the table. When it says he leaned back against Jesus' breast, it means that John's lounge was like this and Jesus' lounge was like this and so John could turn around it weren't necessarily a raised head he could turn around and talk to Jesus that way Judas is on the right hand of Jesus, the place of honor so there's a lot of picture and background going into this John calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, he never identifies himself in this gospel but he, he several times talked about the disciples whom Jesus loved. And it's obvious from the context that he's talking about himself. He just, he won't name himself. So, only the twelve are present. And Jesus has said, one of you is going to betray me. So, they're all looking at one another, reclining around the table. It's a U-shaped kind of table that they're around. And there they are, looking, is it you, is it you, is it you? In one of the other Gospels, Peter says, is it me? Now, Peter is not near Jesus. He's neither laying on Jesus' breast, as John's position is called, nor is he in the right hand, the seat of honor. He's somewhere, and he's able to, to signal to John. Ask him who it is. Now, Peter apparently can't hear what Jesus and John are saying. If he had, if he Peter had heard him say, well, it's Judas. It's the one I give this piece of bread to. You know what Peter's answer would have been. It's clobbering time. He, he'd been all over that. There's no way he could have restrained himself. So, Peter can't hear what's going on. Now, this is something... I give this piece of bread. Actually, that was called the sop. And some of you may have heard that phrase, giving someone a sop, throwing them a sop. The sop, you sopped up the meal with it. They didn't have silverware like we did. They didn't have plates like we did. They had a big communal bowl, and they would take a piece of bread and dip it in like you're doing chip and dip. And that's how they would eat their meal. And so it was customary for the person in the seat of honor to receive the first piece of bread, the first sop, that was normal. It was etiquette. That was the way things were done. And Jesus tells John, it's the one to whom I give this piece of bread. Now to John, what that means is, it's the person of honor at that very meal. Judas is being honored at the moment that he's thinking about betraying Jesus. By turning, John can both see Jesus and Judas. He can see and hear what's going on be between them. And as Jesus hands Judas the host gift to the person who's being honored, it's that sign of friendship, it's that sign of honor. Jesus is actually offering reconciliation to Judas at that very moment when he's dithering, do I do this or not? And Jesus is offering him Friendship. It's a last chance for Judas to change his mind. Verse 27. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do it quickly. No one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money... Some of them thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And it was night. Actually, I should have asked Ruth to highlight and put that last sentence in red. 
and it was night. Because for John, this is a very powerful statement. Remember, all the way through the gospel, we've been seeing these little snippets. You, we must work while it's day, because night is coming when no man can work. Light and dark are the two symbols in John. And you also see them show up in, in the epistles of John. Those things are powerful pictures to him. Judas goes out and it's immediately night. Nightfall has, is here. Jesus said, it's coming. My hour has come. This very moment is what Jesus is talking about. He's given him the sop and it says that immediately Satan entered Judas. Now Judas chose not to repent. Satan can't, you can't walk out of this building and have an evil demon jump on you and wrestle you to the ground and enter you like all the movies like to show you. That's, it can't happen. You cannot be possessed by an evil spirit any quicker than you can be possessed by God's spirit. You have to open yourself. You have to be willing. You have to be playing with it, which is what St. Judas has been doing. So when Jesus offers him the sop, we just read about that in Second Samuel this morning. As soon as David's son got what he wanted, he despised it. I want it, I want it, I want it, I'm going to take it. Oh, I hate it. Judas, as soon as Jesus offers him friendship and honor, he immediately despises it. And he turns away, and the picture is that Satan entered into him. He opened himself to the evil one who then stepped in. Isn't it strange how our culture loves scary stories about supernatural and demons and all of this stuff, but we feel foolish talking about God coming into you and making you a new person? Isn't that bizarre? We feel even more foolish about talking about a corrupt being we call the devil. We play with it, but we're kind of embarrassed by it. Too. So, Jesus makes the announcement to Judas. Well, let me put it another way. Jesus says to Judas, what you're going to do, do it quickly. Everybody thinks he's going to do something, some errand, but that's not what it is. The public announcement, one of you is going to betray me, can you imagine being Judas and hearing that? You're waiting for Jesus to point at you and say, you're the guy, which he never did. But that public announcement did one thing. It got rid of Judas. He couldn't stand it. His conscience could not stand being next to Jesus and receiving morsels from his hand and deal with that. He couldn't handle it. And so... He gets up to leave, and as he's leaving, Jesus says, what you're going to do, do it quickly. Get it over with. Now, John was the only one who knew where Judas was going, because John could hear the conversation. You can bet, as I said earlier, Peter didn't know. He had a sword, remember? He whacked off the high priest's servant's ear later on that night. It's a dark moment. The king of glory is about to be betrayed to his death. And it's nightfall. Now John is writing this, and you need to hear this from him. He is writing this as an eyewitness to the event. And he gives us four facts. One, Judas received the sop of honor. Two, Judas left immediately afterwards. Three, Immediately, it was night. And four, Jesus has stated repeatedly, we must work until the night comes. And so everything is culminating at this point. It is now nightfall. Jesus himself was troubled by the experience. He walked himself into the evil one's parlor and surrendered himself to the will of the evil one. 
Now this is just what the devil was waiting for. If he could kill Jesus, he's thinking, he'll be able to trap God in the prison of death. Isn't it great? But the joke is on Satan. That's God's plan from the beginning. To make it look like he was going to be trapped in death, and in fact, he was going to rise from the dead, overcoming death, not just for himself, but for you, and for you, and for you, for all of you, for me. Overcoming death so that that great enemy, death, will one day be completely defeated. On our behalf, Jesus would submit to Satan and to death and conquer them both. Let's pray. Father, we give glory to you for what you've done. We thank you for your great divine plan from the beginning of the foundations of the world to come in and save us and make us creatures fit for eternity. Help us, Father, to submit to your will, to seek your will, to do your will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.